and they're trying to work in the United States now to basically get laws passed what of what we call freedom to harm that they should destroy biodiversity they should destroy people's health they should spread the cancer epidemic and no one should be able to take them to court every year 200,000 people die because of pesticides uh, so you know these pesticides come from war they come from Hitler's Germany that too was a partnership between, between US corporations and IG Farben if I remember right this person who runs this big you know group of uh, uh, the mafia group uh, if I remember right when he was in Monsanto he had said we have to kill them before they kill us it sounds like there is India is about is, is, is now there's a new style of colonization what I'm hearing from you that there yes. is a new digital dictatorship in agriculture which is which is slowly being the foundations are being laid as we speak you clean up your mess there's only one environmental principle polluter pays polluter doesn't make those who never polluted pay hello and welcome to the wire my name is indra shekhar singh and today we are doing a very special episode with vandana shiva to talk about what challenges does indian agriculture face so vandana ji i'd like to welcome you to the show a very greetings indra and uh, we're so happy to have you back on the wire and you know before the first question i have for you is a uh, is actually quite a serious one because you were as per a wire report it was very clear that you had been targeted by the us government using a, an ngo you know they were they were making a list of people who were actually advocating for ecology and 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 actually fighting against gmos and pesticides and your name from india was on the top so why would the us government be targeting you why are you a threat to uh, you know to the powers that be uh, we are baffled because your work is ecology seeds and agriculture so how do you take this revelation uh, sorry how do you take this news and uh, and why do you think you're the target well you know as as i mentioned when the journalist called me about this uh, report that had been prepared on some of us who have been trying to protect the earth and farmers and people's health is uh, that actually they've been targeting for long it's just that this is more organized and more mafia like uh, because they're not targeting just me they're targeting my family who has nothing to do with my you know we have a relationship but this going for people related to you is a criminal act it's absolutely violation of every form of pri uh, privacy you ask why the government of the us is doing it well you know with globalization uh governments are separate from corporations have just disappeared and i have witnessed the us government functioning as the arm of corporations beginning with the green revolution it was a marketing act you know pushed by the us government us aid world bank etc and uh, i've then watched them really represent monsanto no matter who the president was and no matter what they had said before elections at the end of it all they were doing were pushing the agenda and protecting them and the latest step in all of this is because monsanto was bought by bayer and we had done a monsanto tribunal to basically expose the crimes of these corporations um and these crimes are getting exposed bayer is losing billions because of the harm they have caused and the known link between glyphosate and cancer and they're trying to work in the united states now to basically get laws passed what of what we call freedom to harm that they should destroy biodiversity they should destroy people's health they should spread the cancer epidemic and no one should be able to take them to court so they're trying to insulate themselves and of course attacking every voice that's points out the harm they are, you know they, of course they attacked me they attacked the un rapporteur on food who pointed out every year 200,000 people die because of pesticides uh, so you know these pesticides come from war they come from hitler's germany that too was a partnership between, between the us corporations and ig farben and the standard oil ig farben and uh, that war experiment had continued in agriculture and right now so many alternatives are growing what we have done saving seeds protecting biodiversity showing 
that by intensifying biodiversity, you can you actually grow more food and nutrition, showing that our indigenous seeds have far more nutrition, 200%. Um, and all this evidence is coming out. Uh, and if I remember right, this person who runs this bit, you know, group of uh, uh, the mafia group, uh, if I remember right, when he was in Monsanto, he had said, we have to kill them before they kill us. So that's their mentality. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's their mentality. They work in criminal, uh, their activity is criminal, poisoning the planet. Their style is criminal, as this displays. And their intent is criminal. And uh, our work has been to protect India's rich agricultural heritage. Harvard learned from here, spread organic worldwide. Uh, Steiner learned from here and spread biodynamic worldwide. Um, so we are, we are the home of sophisticated agriculture that works with the earth. We are the so home. I'm going, stop, I'm going to stop you there. You, you said a very important point about colonization and you mentioned the Green Revolution. Now, of course, we all know that the Green Revolution was funded by the USAID, funded by the US government, funded by Rockefellers, your own research and your own books also talk about it. Now, here we are also seeing recently the Indian government, uh, you know, open all its arms and, and they are inviting foreign corporations to come in and, and take over what, what seems like a foreign takeover of Indian agricultural institutions. There is all this is public knowledge where firms like Amazon, firms and Microsoft and other firms have been given exclusive contracts and exclusive, uh, let's just say wheeling dealing is happening behind the curtains at the agriculture ministry, which we read of every day. We hear of new cooperation agreements, new MOUs. How do you see this? If Indian agriculture is so good, why would we need these digital digital firms to step into our Indian agriculture? They influence decision making. They, you know, they bypass the democratic process. Mm -hmm. They don't have dis scientific discussions uh, of the kind we had with the BT Brinjal. After the BT Brinjal was also financed by the U.S. government in the Harvard. You know, it was uh, the biotech project two or three. Um, why are we handing over? I think it comes out of this um, not understanding technology as a tool, not understanding that the digitalization is just a new tool of control and colonization. A, it bypasses every law we have put in place for seed sovereignty, both mm -hmm. at the level of the international law as well as national laws and the seed uh, laws of the FAO, the Biodiversity Act, all of these were put together to defend our sovereignty over seeds and biodiversity. And the digital giants like Microsoft is leading this. And in my book, Oneness versus One Percent that I did with my son, he actually has used technological tools like digitalization to basically get bypass taking permission and just digital genomic mapping with stolen material and taking a patent. So that's the first. The mm -hmm. second is digitalization and digital agriculture is a new mining. It's a new mining of data from farmers. You know, Gates actually sponsors people to go to farms and take photographs of farmers' farm, how they plant the seed, how the bullets work, how, how the slope of the farm is. And then they can consolidate that data and sell it back to the farmer, now through smart applications. And so they're defining really the farmer is empty headed. They're stealing our minds. They're stealing the data. But the third is that all, for example, if you put a drone up in the sky, the only two things a drone can do. First, spray pesticides. And if pesticides are harmful sprayed on the field, Spraying it from the sky means you're not just destroying one farm, you're destroying all the neighboring farms without their permission and their participation. Mm -hmm. And to not assess that the, the tool might be a drone, but the impact really is of spraying pesticides. You cannot mix up the fact that the drone you know, can be clicked around from the fact that it's spraying poison and it'll still have the impacts of cancer. It'll still have the impacts of poisoning. It'll still have the birth defects. The second aspect is surveillance. As it is, 
we have such small farms and a little change in data if our land data is digitalized it is so easy to wipe out ownership the british did it our land used to be a commons the community decided any conflict no one could own land as private property private property was institutionalized during colonial rule sabhi gopal kb used to say and having turned it into private property now they want to use these new tools so that the powerful cannot just define land ownership but they can use all this for the new trick that is being evolved first climate offsets you pollute you continue to pollute you have your private jets you pollute 60 percent of the emissions the rich mm -hmm. the barons and and then you try and control land for your offsets as they've said in debates to me we need sinks and we said we are not your sink sorry you know you clean up your mess there's only one environmental principle polluter pays polluter doesn't make those who never polluted pay by grabbing more resources and no one should forget that gates has become the biggest farmland owner of america mm -hmm. and at, at, around the time when the covid was um, you know spreading he basically said, now I will create one ag, Gates one ag, he called it. And his office of Gates ag one is next to the Monsanto headquarters in Missouri. Uh, he wants one agriculture for the whole world, for the whole world. And he wants fake food. He, he doesn't want like farmers. It sounds, it sounds like there's a new tyranny which is what? happening. Hmm? It sounds like there is, India is about, is, 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 is now there's a new style of colonization. What I'm hearing from you. That there yes. is a new digital dictatorship in agriculture, which is which is slowly being the foundations are being laid as we speak. Will I be correct to say this? You are absolutely correct to say. Just follow a few statements of Gates in the last few weeks. Literally, he said India must change her seeds. When mm -hmm. all evidence is there that not only do we have the richest diversity of the world, but our seeds were bred by the farmers for taste, quality, nutrition, resilience. We've saved climate resilience seeds he just steals them so first to change your seeds second the other he said they he said people don't know how to feed their children so he's going to describe what people will be fed in india and people shouldn't forget that part a big part of his new empire is fake food he has created a new initiative called bio milk for lab made breast milk already the nestle uh, baby food has created havoc and you can imagine, not only is this not a climate solution, you know, what is, uh, uh, it's a zero distance between a baby and the mother. And mm -hmm. he wants miles of shipping of a food that's never been tested for babies. When we know the first food is the healthiest. But he, he is basically taking control of agricultural research. He's taking control of our nutrition ideas. And these will be the issues. And third, of course, he's taking control over our policy making. And that's why the challenge for Indian democracy and the heritage of India. As a civilization, India is an agricultural civilization. We are an Ayurvedic civilization. We know how to eat. Our farmers know how to grow food. To feed 1.4 billion is not a joke. And to trample on that for experiments of a person who just jumped into agriculture in 2019, it is irresponsible. So I would tell the farmers of India, stay strong. And Vandaji, talking of seeds, now there is a whole debate around the whole, there is a, the, the debate is actually restarted around GM seeds in India. The prime minister announced that they will have 126 or 130 odd climate resilience seeds that will be introduced. Now, people from the agricultural field were quite shocked that how can you bring about so many seeds in such a short time? And then simultaneously started uh, the, the, the new policy, you know, there's a whole debate happening right now in the nation about the new GM policy, GM crops policy. Would you have any comment on that? Where are we headed? And should are both these news is linked? The announcement of the prime minister to introduce 130 odd varieties, which are climate resilient, and this national debate on GM crops that's happening right now. Are we being pushed towards GM crops when the world is rejecting them? Well, if, you know, uh, I started to save seeds. 
because the industry was present at a meeting in 87 saying, we will do genetic engineering in order to own the seed. Mm -hmm. And through that, we will collect royalties and we will create a monopoly. They said we'll be five companies controlling all the seed of the world and all the agrochemicals of the world. And we will use international law, which became TRIPS of WTO. Now, India has played a huge role in challenging this illegitimate monopoly because seeds are not an industrial product. Seeds are not a manufacturer. A corporation doesn't create a seed. Seed is ev evolution in making. You can modify it a little bit. You can hybridize it. You can add a gene through a gene gun, but you cannot create the seed from scratch. So, uh, on climate resilience, that too is a very false argument because why have in these 30 years of genetic engineering and biotechnology, there been only two applications. They used to talk in the beginning, oh, we're going to grow food on the moon in the Sahara on toxic dumps. But they gave us four crops, corn, canola, cotton, soya, with two traits, herbicide resistant, Roundup resistant, and Bt toxin. The Bt has failed, totally failed. And in addition to that, recently, we've had a Supreme Court order that the government must take responsibility to regulate because what we have are only rules. We don't have a law. And these rules were under the Environment Protection Act of 89. These rules are what we used to challenge Monsanto when they came into India illegally. But we need a law. And there's an international law. I had a role in shaping it through the Convention on Biological Diversity. We have a Carter-Henna protocol on biosafety. And the court has said, A, you must implement this protocol in full work. Second, they said is you've had two parliamentary committees in a democracy. Parliament is the highest authority. Listen to those committees. They've made recommendations. Don't try and bypass them. And the other thing they've said is because the debate has always been intense, uh, a technical expert committee was created. And that expert, a technical expert committee has extremely clear recommendations of what should be happening in, um, in biosafety. First is, biosafety is the impact of GMOs. It is not the making of GMOs. So you cannot put people who are engaged in that discipline of biotechnology in charge of safety. Safety has to be soil scientists, entomologists, health people, every discipline of every field that can be potentially impacted. And we in Navdani have done studies on what happens to soil. Vidarbha, in the first four years, 60% beneficial organisms had died, not a pollinator on a Bt toxin plant. So that's all there. Why only two traits? Because these are traits where you can, through a, a single gene, add a toxic grade. Of course, they add antibiotic resistance markers, viral promoters, etc. All complex traits of disease resistance Climate resilience are multi genetic traits and they cannot be engineered. Mm -hmm. The well, whole plant works at it. Mm -hmm. and, and so, anyone who says I've made a GMO for climate resilience has just stolen it. We made a list of 1,500 pirated climate resilient crops where all they do is just do the genomic mapping. You know? They take 1,000 seeds of salt tolerant rices. And then they just do a man, uh, general mapping. And then they say, we make a guess of these thousand, which are the poor, probable winning candidates. And they just mark out a part of a general. But every living organism is a complex self-organized system where every, if you look at the maps, every gene is connected to every other gene. Every trait is created by multiple genes. Every gene contributes to multiple traits. This linear, uh, one-dimensional thinking of genetic determinism is so outdated. And that's what this is based on. And it's very easy to give some money to an institution and train some people to just work with the machines. you know, And then, and then you guide the patterns. So uh, Bayer, uh, no, um, Gates has a huge number of patterns on climate resilience. And when he's merging his, the IT, with this biopiracy, 
he thinks he can be on a fast forward. And we, as a, a ancient agrarian culture who, who have evolved the richest diversity of crops, we are the babble of center of most of the crops. Mm -hmm. And we're giving it all up to a few pirates of today. No, an ancient civilization can't do this to herself, especially when we claim we are protecting our heritage. Second, everything is shown, whether it's the green revolution or the biotech, it has failed, BT has failed. And the third thing is, we know the monopolistic status or whether it's an Amazon or a Microsoft. Microsoft was, was tried and by the US Congress for an antitrust case. He is mm -hmm. known to be a pirate. That's how he became a giant. He's known to be a pirate through patents. That's how he created Microsoft. Now that he's entering the field of biodiversity, seed and agriculture, and a country like India, where there's so much, you know, I, I think it would be immoral for every individual of India, local governments, regional governments, national government to not listen to the Supreme Court and Jane. do what is the duty under our constitution. Now, changing track a little bit, Mandanji, because, you know, we, we, we have limited time, but I would also like you to comment. It's been 10 years of the Paramparagat uh, Krishi mission of the Pradhan Mantri, which is basically the organic farming mission. Uh, how would you see, and I know you, your main research is into systems and how systems operate. So how do you see this, this 10 years and actually the organic mission on the ground? Do you think actually the government has done enough to promote organic agriculture, ecological agriculture, natural farming in the country? And are there any signs or any visible achievements that we can see on the field, in your opinion? Well, the first thing is there's enough scientific evidence mm -hmm. that GMOs and organic cannot coexist. That mm -hmm. is why the international standards on organic certification do not allow GMOs. So everything that's exported has to go through a GMO test. Now that they're trying to push herbicide tolerant basmati, they're destroying one of the most popular crops because that herbicide will stand. This herbicide is known to contribute to bladder and colon cancer. Why are we poisoning our food system? We are not a civilization of, of violence and war in our food system. We know how to do farming. We know what food is and how health is connected to food. And we know the consequences. When you ask me, I think we need a white paper. We definitely mm -hmm. don't need a white paper, not just the budgets that were allocated. That's so easy to allocate and let it get disappeared. Um, we need a white paper uh, to declare to parliament that these were the promotional schemes. This was the natural farming. This was Padamburgadi. This was this, this was. We have done this. And allow the parliament to visit. I would really think it's time to create a third parliamentary committee. That time it was the two committees, uh, Buddha Dev and then um, Renuka uh, Chaudhary. Uh, these committees looked at biotechnology and the risks it was posing and the need for biosafety. I think now we need a committee that will both look at the real potential of ecological systems Mm -hmm. Look at the government schemes and have they delivered, have they not delivered. Look at the, ex the you know, we've had 30 years of uh, the BT cotton. They, they all looked at it, look at it again. And the parliament should frame the policy of how the government has to function. And they cannot be just like you cannot have GMOs and organic growing together. You just cannot have it. You cannot have natural farming commitments one day and we will do GMOs the next day. It doesn't hold together scientifically, ecologically. So mm -hmm. there must be consistency and there must be a com clear commitment. In fact, I was in the south of India launching the GMO Satyagraha again because of the response. And um, very, very clearly, People are saying, you know, one day you tell us to be a natural and next day you tell us to contaminate our food system. So I, I think the, uh, the people need to make up their minds. But we definitely need the, the technical expert committee adhered to. Those were the most eminent scientists that put the whole discipline together. And we need 
respect for the old parliamentary committees and the creation of a new parliamentary standing committee to look at these most important studies of science and technology in our time, the most important issues of agriculture in our time, more, and most important issues, of course, worldwide, but for India particularly, because not only has the civilization protected, you know, therefore, the last 40 years, movements like ours have regenerated. We saved 4,000 varieties of rice. That's what the future will be. That's what these people want to pirate. Why would a responsible government say, I will not let farmers use their own seeds for their own welfare. I will allow pirates to take patents and charge royalties from them. We've seen what this did to the BT crisis. We've seen how the suicide started. We have seen the despair that it created. Failure, accepting failure, repeated failure is not a scientific approach. When you see something you said would be right, the best would be controlled and they're not getting controlled. Good scientific approaches, what's a better way? And biodiversity is the better way, just, just on, on my table. Right on my table is a new paper of the kind of science I do. And uh, it's showing here. In nature, nature saying field study use biodiversity instead of pesticides can reduce uh, crop damage from, you know, here, here's the science. You know, you let the pests, uh, insects flourish, you let the plants flourish. You don't need poisons. So we have to have a poison free future. And, and uh, you, with, this, with this, like, you know, I come to my last question because government can play a very important role in actually pushing ecology and turning back to really the Indian ways of farming, the Bharatiya ways of farming. You know, the government can, if it has mandate and political will, can change that. Do you think that having a price floor or an MSP, a minimum support price for ecologically grown crops or for farmers who are doing ecological farming or organic farming may actually spread the movement far and wide across the country? Well, I think a fair price, which is a minimum support price, which is merely a declaration that mm -hmm. a market with monopolies tending towards exploitation of farmers, it must be regulated. Why do we create the Essential Commodities Act? Because of the Great Bengal Famine. Mm -hmm. We've had the experience. So it, it wasn't made mindlessly. And why do the corporations want to get rid of it? When Monsanto wanted to get rid of it, because this was the act used to regulate the seed prices in cotton and bring the prices down. So mm -hmm. the re regulation of a mad market is absolute responsibility, particularly in essential things like food. And it's vital not just for the grower who gets a fair price, it's also vital for the majority of people. After all, 80% of India is being given food for free. You want to unleash them on the market, A. And two, if you don't take care of your farmers today, where will your food for tomorrow come from? Will you be importing? And will you be then feeding junk food? And you'll be feeding fake food? So Dur Darshi is part of what our government needs to be on the food issue. Why did we have 10 year plans? So that you look ahead. Today it's one minute lobby. The lobbyist comes in this door and gets a deal. And, uh, and that's what corporations spread. So I would definitely say the minimum support price is the minimum shift that is needed. But the second is an authentic promotion of an agriculture that regenerates the land, the water, the biodiversity, and agriculture that does not extract from the farmer. So a poison-free farming and a GMO-free farming, that's the way to reduce the burden of costs. The corporations have shot the costs up. And the third is, you know, we are becoming a very sick nation, just in my valley in Deirdun. By the day I see a hospital come up, you know, okay, Ayushman can pay for that minute. But healing of a society needs a commitment to the food system. And that commitment is a commitment to the earth, to the farmer and to the citizens of the country. That's the watershed we are in. The world is waking up. How can India go to sleep at this point? Thank you so much, Vandana Ji, for, this, uh, for your time today and, and speaking to us.
viewers, if you have more questions, I know there are, you know, she re she makes you think a lot and there are many questions that come to mind. So if you have a few, don't forget to comment on our YouTube channel or tweet on our Twitter page. We will be promised to answer a few of them for sure. So thank you for watching. And Mannaji, thank you for being on the show. Thank and you, Indra. Thank you.